and like broke down a door to get in to continue the argument with the boyfriend who then apparently ran to the bathroom, locked himself in there. Oh, and this man. sequence of events repeated itself until we had five broken doors off the hinges. Ooh. What is up you guys, Matt McKeever here and so in today's video myself and Dan Warren sit down and just chat about some of our tips and tricks when it comes to dealing with student rental income properties. And now student rental income properties can be some of the best income properties you can find, some of the best cash flow you're going to find, particularly I know in my market, London, Ontario, they're by far the most profitable income properties you can find that aren't going to be in a war zone neighborhood. That being said, students can definitely be rough on your rental properties and so we discuss some of the tips and tricks that we've put into our uh, systems and processes to try and make our student rentals run smoother. I think you guys are gonna get a lot of value from this. So if you do, make sure you smash that like button and definitely check out my other videos. And if you're new to my channel, definitely smash that subscribe button. But let's just jump into me and Dan discussing student rentals. What is up you guys, Matt here with Dan. And so today we're gonna be chatting with you about student rental properties. So as you know, I own three student rentals all by Fanshawe. Dan's kind of the OG of student rentals. He's got 12 student rentals now by Fanshawe. And so we figured let's just share with you guys our tips and kind of our personal experiences with student rentals because I think it's an area that a lot of people are curious about, but not a lot of like gurus or YouTube channels really document a lot about student rentals. And so I figured let's just kind of dive into it. So I've been doing it since 2010. Dan's been doing it since 2012, but I think if you take up like all the years that we've owned <laughs> individual houses, it adds up to quite a while. So uh, yeah, I guess where should we start, Dan? I think one of the most common questions I get are about leases and kind of how to approach leases. So yeah. uh, 12 month, eight month leases, doesn't matter when you start your lease, do you put everyone on the same lease? Do you get individual guarantors? There's like a million questions I get hit up with yeah, frequently. Yeah. So let, let's just yeah, so dive in. All, you all start talking about things, it and I'll yeah. start spinning out my opinions on yeah, top. Yeah, for sure. So I would say like um, when you're talking about um, the lease length, yeah. uh, when you're really close to the school, you can get 12 month lease. You, you really, well, I would never even take an eight month lease, but some people do Same. when they're further away, right? Yeah. But yeah, I would, I would rather take a, a 12 month lease at a lower rate. Yeah, agree. That, you know, if the house is further away from the school, then to take an eight month lease because it screws up your cash flow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's really inconsistent from a cash flow perspective as well. I think in theory, you're, there's even just some extra hassles. Like, I know some landlords then will try and get cute and they try and rent it out for that four month period at a, a very subsidized price point, right? But then you get into the risk of what if that tenant doesn't want to leave? It can mess up your whole next year, which is your real yes. bread and butter, right? That's really the uh, the heart of the of your profit motive. So I think that's something that people need to be way more aware of when they're doing these eight month leases. Because I know landlords mm -hmm. look at it and they're like, but I can get 650 a month a bedroom if I rent it out for eight months versus 500 or 550. Yeah, it and it's like, uh, like even if you break it out and there is a mathematical argument towards the eight month lease, I think that you're opening yourself up to a bunch of other uh, uncertainties like the risk that your short term th uh, four month renters might decide to stick around and you got them now signed at that that much lower rate and so you're again opening yourself up to they might just decide to stick around for far too long. So Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, 12 month lease is where it's at. Yeah. Um, so I think one thing that's interesting is we were talking about this before uh, shooting this and I'm very adamant that the leases have to be made to April. So <laughs> I'm curious to get your perspective. And so the reason I'm so adamant about the idea of May to April is we used to do September to August and every summer like clockwork I find myself in an argument with parents being like but my kid doesn't live there now I shouldn't have to pay you. And I'm like but you signed a legal contract you have to pay me. <laughs> and like. I would always eventually get paid, but man, the arguments I'd have to get on the phone with these parents that they're just like, but my kid's done school. I shouldn't have to pay you if they're not going to school. And I'm like, no, that's not how contracts work. You don't just get to change the rules midway through a contract because you're done. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious, do you come up with those problems when you're doing a September to August lease? Um, I have never experienced that. And really? That's, that's strange because about... 40% of mine are either August or September lease starts, uh, yeah. 12 month lease. And so, and then of course the other 60% is May. 
and uh, no, I never experienced that. So it's interesting that people have different issues. Yeah. And uh, I, I don't know, maybe I have, I just don't remember. But, but yeah, no, it, it was never a big issue for me. But I like it because, because my portfolio is strictly student uh, yeah. housing related, that it evens up my cash flow, right? Because I'm taking first and last uh, True. at the beginning of the year. So it, yeah. it evens up my cash flow. Yeah, I guess I never so, thought about that once you start getting into double yeah, digits. With I, I've thought properties. about it a bit. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Um, so then thoughts on, do you have people on individual leases, group leases, guarantors? Does each person have to have a guarantor? Does just the group need a guarantor? How do you approach that? Yeah, so I like to do group leases and uh, for the full rent of all the people living in there yeah. for the lease. And then I like to break it down inside the guarantor form as to what they individually are, the guarantor is responsible for if that tenant doesn't pay. So five, let's just say the rent's 500 a room, then you, it would be three, like if there's six people, it'd be 3,000 a month. And then you would just have the guarantor guarantee that 500 a month. And it, it makes the, the parents comfortable, uh, makes the students, it makes everybody's life better. And truly, like, are you gonna come back at somebody, like the, the amount of, uh, you know, pain in the ass factor of coming back to at, at yeah. somebody that has paid their rent because some other guy hasn't paid their rent. Mm. It's like, and the funny thing is students always pay their, almost always, unless I'm taking over a property, they always pay their yeah. rent. So, so I don't really worry about that too much, but of course you still have the guarantor form to back you up. Yeah, I, I think that's huge. And I agree, my experiences actually have been very similar. I, I don't think we've ever had a tenant not pay us from a student rental, like for rent. We've had them not pay us for damages, but yeah. pretty much they, they actually are pretty good. I don't know if it's because they have OSAP money or just because they have access to student lines of credit, but uh, yeah, we've never really struggled too much with that either. Um, so what other best practices are you using in your properties? Like, do you avoid carpet? Are you okay with carpet? Like, do you use certain flooring products, certain? Yeah, I've kind of learned that as I, I went, but um, yeah, some of my houses have hardwood floor, but I would never install it yeah. uh, because it's very expensive. But um, I do, uh, I rip out carpets usually. I have a couple houses that have carpet, but the rest of them don't, they have, uh, I still have some houses with laminate flooring, but it's terrible for some yeah. houses. Cause I, I've had a, a friend of mine, he um, had a student house that, had, that he put brand new laminate in. And I don't know whether they left a window open or if, whether it was beer just like yeah. sitting on it, but it bowed the whole floor up. He had to rip, it was like a year or two old. He had to rip all the floor yeah. and redo it. I think far too many people don't realize that laminate floors, like and what we're talking about with laminate floors is kind of the planks, right? Is that they're not waterproof. And so like they'll swell, no. right? Like yeah. it, it's essentially like kind of like think of it as like cardboard or a chipboard, right? It's going to swell once moisture gets in it. And I've seen that so many student rental properties and like it just looks terrible and creates a yeah. terrible experience where what you end up having is everywhere where there's seams, it, it it puffs out right it's going to bow out and uh yeah and you know you might save yourself a dollar to a square foot by going laminate versus vinyl plank uh in the short term but that vinyl plank will still be there if you get good vinyl plank uh the stuff that doesn't have any stickiness to it that's just literally you can pull it out and it can be dripping wet and you can put it back together yeah that floor will last like forever versus yes. these uh cheap uh Laminate planks, you know, I, yeah, I think as student rental, you're probably lucky if it lasts five years, sadly. Yeah, yeah. Um, and same with, cause like, it can even happen, like I've had people just, they didn't know how to care for it, so they wet mopped it, and they wet mopped it aggressively, and then didn't dry mop it afterwards. Yeah. And it swole, like, wow. right? And it was like, oh, it was so frustrating. And, and it, don't get me wrong, it was the cheap stuff from like Home Depot, you know, the $1.99 or less a square foot that I yeah. bought. So I should have known better, but that's definitely one tip I'd share is like get indestructible flooring in a student rental because you just don't want to deal with like, I've had terrible, we've never put in carpet, but I've had ter terrible experiences with carpets that we've inherited. Same with laminate floors that we've inherited. Um, I definitely like tiles and vinyl plank. Yeah. Uh, another couple of tips I would uh, suggest, uh, going back to what we were saying about the 12 month lease, um, 
one thing is if you get a bunch of student properties, what you're going to try not to do is like, let's just say you wanted to do an eight month lease because you were desperate, you had to fill your room or whatever, although I'm never desperate to fill rooms. Um, if you did that, you're kind of cannibalizing your other properties. True. You know, you're, you're like, you low, if you lower the rent at, let's say you lower the rent at one property to get it rented, well then now people know that. Like people talk, especially when mm -hmm. you own a bunch, they know yeah. each other and they're like, well, why am I paying this and at this house? And I've literally gotten to arguments with tenants where they're like, my yeah. friends live at that house and they point down the street and they're like, they're only paying 450 a bedroom. I'm like, cool. <laughs> like yeah. not my problem, man. That's like right. you signed a lease for four ninety five. We're holding you to four ninety five, right? right? Like you, you're an adult. You made this decision, but yeah, that happens so often. I think they're particularly when you do own several, right? Like if yeah. they know your landlord at a different property and that you dropped your price. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, hundred percent. And another thing I would say about the twelve month lease is the um, the when you're gonna get new students uh, at the end of that 12 month lease let's say unless you're lucky and they stay which is nice a lot cheaper uh, but what I would say is suggesting uh, giving I usually give a five day period where yes this was yeah, huge yeah. we started doing it now so like instead of having literally a 365 day lease mm -hmm. it's more like a 360 day lease and yeah. it just gives you more time to flip the property right for the next group of tenants because uh, at least in my experience, students never move out with it being turnkey ready. There's always a ton of garbage and stuff and yeah, um, yeah you just don't want it have to be there April 30th till like <laughs> 5 a.m. in the morning and then you yeah. have the other U-Haul show up at 6 a.m. with the students moving in. You still got students moving out. Like that's usually the biggest stress for my renting to students is like the move in, move out process. Because again, if you don't get off on the right foot, I found that like if you have parents mad at you at the start, they're gonna stay mad for the rest of the year, and it makes yeah. for a terrible year. Yeah, it takes a long time to turn that ship. <laughs> <laughs> how, um, how do you avoid people locking themselves out, Dan? Um, so like, because like at the start when we used to first start doing this, like again, that was one of my biggest pain in the ass factors was simply people texting at two a.m. because they're drunk and they're locked out of their bedroom or out of the house. Okay, I'm I'm not the brightest, so like <laughs> the way I do it is different than everybody else. They do it the smart way, which is they get the number pad. Yes. The, the where they can you know if they lock themselves out of the front door, they can get mm -hmm. themselves back in. But for myself, I still have the like I do the uh, smart key, uh, Wiser smart keys. So yes. Do that. That's actually a huge. Yeah, that's another tip inside of a tip. The yeah. Little, uh, but yeah, so I use that so that I can switch out the the locks very easily mm -hmm. without having to actually physically buy new locks. So that saves time and money there. But so I have that issue of people getting yeah. locked out because they, you know, they don't can't press the the button. So. Uh, I don't know. Uh, so I'm not smart that like way. How often are you or your property manager having to go to a place because someone's locked themselves out? It comes in uh, phases. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. At the beginning of the year, it's pretty bad. Like I go, <laughs> I go down there probably five times a week. <laughs> but uh, the first couple of weeks, you know, you go a few times. But, you know, regular, like in the summer, you're probably maybe going to have one person the entire summer. And I, you know, I have upwards of 70 tenants now. So yeah, that's in the summer, it's, it's easy. But in the, in, you know, when they're in school, you know, I probably drive there maybe 20 times a year, maybe. But just not That's too not bad. actually too bad. That's not about too bad. I bet that like it's one of those 80 20 things where you're driving for the same person over and over again yes. versus. Yes. Yes, I am. <laughs> um, and so just circling back to some of what Dan was mentioning. So, uh, in terms of the padlocks, so like what we're talking about there is just like where it's battery operated, you can punch in like between a four and eight digit code. Uh, and that'll unlock the deadbolt for you. Um, I put that on all my student rentals simply because it does make. It essentially guarantees they can't lock themselves out as long as it has batteries. And that's reduced the amount of trips we need to go out in order to let people in. But another thing I really like is you can set up separate codes or one time codes on these and let your tradesperson in, right? So like yeah. often we'll try and schedule like, oh, so-and-so is going to be there to fix the toilet or fix the sink between, you know, three and 5 p.m. Can you just make sure someone's home? And then just no one's home, right? And I used to have to like slip out from work or slip out from another project and go and like let them in where now we can just text them and be like, use this code and they're able to let themselves in. So that's definitely been 
something that I found very helpful, but I just want to touch upon too, the smart keys. Smart keys have changed the amount of money I spend on locks a year yeah. because what it is is with Waji, you're simply going to put in uh, the original key plus like this little pin, you turn it sideways, you pull out the key that it did work, you put in a new key, to turn it back, and all of a sudden now you have a rekeyed uh, lock. And so that's huge with student rentals because the tenants don't want the previous tenants having access to the unit and there's concerns where they've maybe just moved down the street or yes. one of their friends had a spare key and things like that and so being able to really fastly re-key um, a door is huge to us and same with bedrooms right as well um, each of our individual bedrooms will often have a lock on it right and mm -hmm. being able to re-key that fast and easily is so much better because with a locksmith you might end up paying between 20 and 40 dollars a lock to get them to re-key the lock Whereas with like the smart key deadbolt, you're maybe talking about 50 or $60 for the lock itself and the cost to rekey it's literally five minutes. So yeah. I just really want to build upon that. I think that's huge. Um, how do you deal with like conflicts between tenants? Like, do you have a lot of, like, do you end up having to be uh, their social worker or? Yeah, sometimes, sometimes <laughs> that happens. It's happened a couple times this year. Um, but it's, you know, it's not the end of the world. Um, I try to get them to work things out themselves if it possible. And this is why it's so beneficial to get groups instead of individuals. Yes, that's a great you point know, too. Because then really, if you get individuals, it, it really is your problem you know, that you have to deal yeah. with. But if they're groups, well, it's like, well, I'm sorry that you don't like your friends. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, uh, but you know, I try my best to have them deal with it themselves. It, like, But I don't just say deal with it yourself. I just try to get them to come to that conclusion that that's what yeah. they're gonna need to do. And if that if all else fails, you could always move them to a different house if you have uh, yeah, that actually multiple houses. Yeah, that is a handy yeah. opportunity where yeah. you can kind of slot them in and out. Yeah. Um, I think that is huge. Uh, otherwise, what are some other tips for student rentals? So I'm trying to think of what other questions I frequently get. Um, what, what sort of rules are you using to invest? Like I know when we started investing, we called it the uh, the fifty thousand dollar bedroom rule. And so what we'd want to do is we we'd only buy a property if we're buying it for fifty thousand dollars a bedroom. So a five bedroom house near Fanshawe, we'd only be willing to pay two fifty for it. Do you have any like rules of thumbs you use? And I know that they've changed over yeah. the last few years because the markets drastically changed. Well, yeah, the cap rates were eleven, and now they're <laughs> seven. So that's yeah. different. But you can turn them into eleven if you <laughs> you know if you uh, want to do some work, which is nice. Um, but as far as yeah, I never really think about how much per bedroom. But I mean, I I do look at it. Like mm -hmm. I look at it. Like you said, if you if you look at a house, you want to be like you said, either paying two fifty for a five bedroom or paying three hundred for a six. Yeah. Both of those prices would be amazing right now. <laughs> Unlikely to happen unless you get a private deal, but it's possible. Anything's possible. Yeah. But. Do you do like other value adds like uh, cable or internet included? Well, that's, yeah, that's a very good point too. Uh, I include Wi-Fi in all my houses and it's high speed. I don't cheap out. Uh, and since I have- High speed unlimited, right? I'm unlimited, yes, yeah. yes. Don't You don't want to have a conversation about somebody going over their limit. Like, you know what I mean? You got better things to do with your yes. life. I hope so, <laughs> but um, so yeah, we just get that. And since we get so many um, uh, of the same company, use one company for it. And I just, uh, I get them to give me a deal. So I pay $60 per house, Oh, nice! you know, because you know, you get 12 of these uh, contracts with this one company, they're going to give you a deal because they want to keep you. Yeah. Do you so, find yourself having to troubleshoot a lot of IT problems or do the tents like directly interact with the uh, internet provider or? Um, usually I deal with it, but there's, it's few and far between. And if it is, if it becomes major, I just like, if they need a new modem or something, I just, I just add them. I call Rogers and I add them to the people that can deal with problems list, which I forget what they call this. You, um, something user or something. Yeah. Anyways, it's relevant. Uh, but yeah, so you add them to that and then they can actually go into the store and get oh, themselves get a new okay. modem. So it's handy that way. And then they're, ha they're happy to do it because they're, they're getting a new modem mm -hmm. and their service is gonna be better, let's say, because you have so many devices. Like if each person has two or three devices, 
Which and you got six people. Normal. That's 18 yeah. devices on one thing. So mm -hmm. you want to make sure that you have updated equipment. Like don't cheap out on like, uh, let's just say you're using um, a router or something. Like I have that integrated with the modem. But if you're using that, don't cheap out. Buy the best equipment. Yeah. Because it's one of the most important things. This is the lifeblood for those students. Yes. It you really know? is huge. <laughs> yeah. Um. So do you get problems with like people torrenting and stuff? Are you getting letters like cease and desist from Rogers? Oh, yeah. Or? All the time. I get, though, I get emails all the time from Rogers that just says uh, you know this person's and as soon as, as soon as I realized what it is I just delete it immediately because I don't really care it's not my problem what they do with the internet that's that's oh the, so you don't stress about that at all it's just oh, in one care. year out the it's other. irrelevant well in Canada the laws I won't get into the laws yeah. but but yeah it's 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 kind of one of those things that's just like well could you do this like I don't know it's like getting a letter uh, would you like a new credit card? Like, okay, throw it in the garbage, who cares, you know? <laughs> no, I think that's a great point though, because I've had several landlords reach out to me about that, where they're like, oh, I want to start packaging internet together, but I'm concerned because what if they do something illegal with the internet? Yeah, people can do something illegal with your house too. They can be selling drugs that's out That's a great point. So, I mean, that's a heck of a lot worse than, I don't know, stealing a movie you know, yeah and watching some disney movie on the thing so yeah. <laughs> which is usually what it is it's like it's usually game of thrones that i get letters for <laughs> and uh, a lot but uh, interesting mm. um so otherwise we're what other approaches are you using at your student rentals um do you a lot of your properties probably include a garage is that just included with the rent do you try and do anything extra with that Yes, I have been told by some friends that I should be renting it out individually because uh, I could be making more money, which is true. There's more uh, there's more cash flow to happen there. Uh, but I like to include it uh, that they can use the garage because then like you, uh, like Matt has said in previous videos, yeah. right, you, they can use that um, to put their garbage in and then you don't get a letter from the city saying, <laughs> hey, we picked up your garbage that was all over your front lawn, give us $300. And I've paid way too many of those over the years. Um, and so I'm curious, how do you deal with garbage? Um, because like frequently I know what ends up happening is I drop by start of September, my garage is clean, you could almost eat off of the floor, then I'll drop by in November or December, and it just looks like it's an apocalyptic wasteland of like broken furniture and yeah. garbage bags and two fours. I find that that's usually first year students. I try not, that's another tip. <laughs> yeah. Uh, try your best not to get first year students, especially if you're at the college level. It may be a little different with the university, but probably not. <laughs> um, I'm giving a little too much credit there, but um, no, yeah, I've had that before with first years. They fill your garage full of garbage mm -hmm. bags and you're like, oh well, and then when they go on Christmas break, you get your handyman in there and he takes it all away and then it never gets yeah. mentioned again because I don't, <laughs> I don't bother with, you know what I mean? So you can mention stuff and some people are going to listen, yeah. but like some people won't listen and when they don't listen, you have to take action. Yeah, and so I think that's a big point is uh, student rentals are a high margin investment, right? Um, it's some of the best returns you're going to find, at least in London, Ontario. And so far too often I see landlords that get into the student rental game, they're taking things too personally. Um, and so like where it's like, how dare you do that to my garage? Like, how dare you do this? And it's like, yeah, I don't think they understand yeah. who their target customer is, right? Um, because that should, yeah. like, not that it's right, but I think you should have an expectation for some of these common problems to happen to you. And so I think that that's just important that for landlording in general, but particularly student rental landlording, like, very rarely is it actually a personal attack upon you that yeah. the person's making by disrespecting your property. It's more just like they're not thinking or yeah. they just they don't have the life experience to realize that the sequence of events can have consequences. Um, That's right. Because, yeah, like I'd, I'd be interested. I think this is probably a good point to start wrapping up, but I thought I'd share one of the weirdest stories I've had from one of my student rentals and then you can jump in with one of yours. So what we had one time was uh, uh, there was a, a young couple living in one of our student rentals. I would recommend not renting to people that are <laughs> dating each other. Um, I found, you know, houses that are all male or all female can be good. Um, it can be a mixed bag depending, but I found mixed houses to frequently be the sources of the most problems. Mm. They've also in theory been our best. Like sometimes they're the absolute best tenants because they're actually very mature and responsible and that's why they can live in a co-sex house yep. without any sort of drama or issues. But I've also found that to be the opposite where they're on the very low end of the 
student spectrum because they're hardcore partiers and whatever. And so one of the things that I experienced uh, at, I think this was actually our first year of being student landlords, was a boyfriend and girlfriend were renting from us. They got into an argument and uh, it must have got very heated. And the girlfriend took a hammer and like broke down a door to get in to continue the argument with the boyfriend who then apparently ran to the bathroom, locked himself in there. Oh, and this man. sequence of events repeated itself until we had five broken doors off the hinges. Ooh. So that was one of my first forays into student rentals. Um, it was a very interesting thing. At the same time, I think we ended up recouping probably 50 to 70% of the cost. So it wasn't like, it. Frequently, like I have these crazy horror stories of what students have done to my properties, but often I'm able to recuperate in full or close to in full the entire damage. So other than just the hassle, it ends up not being a major factor, but I'd be curious if you got a crazy story you'd like to share or... Yeah, maybe we'll leave that for another video actually because it's pretty long okay, right now. Fair enough. But uh, yeah, these things happen. These yeah. things happen. And again, if, I'd love to hear your perspective, Dan, but I think the key is just not taking it personal. Yeah, I agree. The guys, I, I can tell the guys that will make it in the business because yeah. I, I meet them all the time. I'm always walking down the street, want to meet new investors. Yeah. And uh, sometimes these guys come up to me and they seem super like excitable and stuff. You got to <laughs> be calm. And like Matt said, like they're 19. Yeah. They're going to make mistakes. A lot of the time it's not on purpose or even when it is, it's like, you know, you got to be uh, fair but firm just like mm -hmm. you are with your other tenants. But uh, you got to give a little bit extra leeway uh, to the students because, you know, things happen. And uh, but temperament is very important. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, I think that's a great point. <laughs> words. I forgot how words work, guys. I think this is a good point as any to wrap up this video at this point. So smash that like button if you enjoyed it. Hit the subscribe button if you're new to my channel. And check out Dan on Instagram. You can find him Dan Warren Vegan on Instagram. And otherwise, until the next video, remember, making money is a team sport. There's more than enough money in this world for us to all make it. But if you're not saving it, I mean, like, what's the point? Thanks, guys. Bye. So those are some of the tips and tricks myself and Dan Warren have shared with each other over the years on how to try and make our student rentals run smoother. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you smash that like button, hit the subscribe button if you're new to my channel, and definitely check out the other videos YouTube wants you to check out. And until next time, remember, making money is a team sport. There's more than enough money in this world for us to all make it, but if you're not saving it, I mean like, what's the point, guys? Thanks, bye!